Good afternoon and welcome to Tea Time with the Jackson Center. I am Kirsten McMahon, the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. Today's tea is sponsored by the Jamestown Bar Association. Uh, Justice Jackson was a distinguished member of the JBA and it continues to promote the professional interests of its members, foster pride in the profession, and encourage civility and collegiality in the practice of law. Our guest today is Riaz Kanji, a founding member of Kanji and Katzen, and he is the directing attorney for the firm's Ann Arbor, Michigan office. Riaz is widely viewed as a leading trial and appellate litigator on behalf of Indian nations uh, and the tribes across the, across the country. And Riaz, thank you so much for joining me for tea today. Thank, thank you for having me. As, as I've mentioned to you, uh, I'm especially happy to be here today for two reasons. One, uh, Justice Jackson is, is truly a judicial hero of mine, and uh, not only for what he said, but how he, how he said it, and uh, his, his clarity in, in writing and, and accessibility of his opinions to not just to lawyers, but the broader public, I think, is a, a model for us all. And uh, secondly, as I mentioned to you, there's a, a nice personal connection for me. I grew up just across the border in St. Catharines, Ontario, and uh, one of my best friends uh, in high school was from Jamestown. I've spent quite a bit of time in Jamestown and Chautauqua in, in my childhood, so it's really nice to have the, the connection. I always appreciate the, hearing those stories. I uh, never cease to be amazed at both the number of connections that people have to this area and then certainly their love of Justice Jackson and his writing, especially in the legal community, um, the general esteem with which his writing and his opinions and I think most importantly, his clarity uh, is, is always nice to hear. So during our setup, you and I chatted about what might be the best place to start our conversation today. Um, and so rather than starting with the recent Supreme Court decision itself, we're going to take a step back and look through a slightly wider lens initially um, and start with talking about how the tribes and nations fit into the general political structure of the United States. Sure. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting facet of our political system and, and one that uh, people don't always fully appreciate. But in this country, we have you know three uh, three separate sovereigns. We have the the federal government, of course, the states, and we have tribes who uh, have long been understood and held by the Supreme Court to be a separate, distinct sovereigns. Uh, some of Chief Justice Marshall's most famous opinions are actually the the the, the Cherokee trilogy, uh, Worcester v. Georgia, and companion cases, which stood for the proposition, still stand for the proposition that tribes are separate sovereigns, separate and apart from the states and are not subject to state control or domination. And while, you know, in many ways, uh, those principles have been uh, honored in the, in the breach for large parts of our history, uh, we are a country founded on the rule of law and the rule of law persists. And over time, that principle has endured and has allowed tribes to remain as, as separate independent uh, governments within our, within our political system. Well, it's certainly something when we think back to our history classes in school, we certainly learn of the state sovereignties and the powers reserved to the states and then the federal um, purview uh, with regard to the law, but we don't really learn that much about the sovereignty sovereignty of the tribes and the nations. And so it's interesting that very early on in our country's history, there are these the trilogy of cases that sort of make sure that that is, is public and set. Um, although, as you said, not necessarily followed. I know exactly. And, you know, it, it, of course, we, we're so far removed from that time period now. But at that time, the, the relations between uh, the states, the settlers, and the tribes were very much at the forefront of the national consciousness. And you know, Worcester v. Georgia was a, an incredibly important case and emblematic, actually, of a lot of what was happening uh, in the South and the East at the time. And that ties actually directly into uh, the McGirt case that the Supreme Court just decided. But there, the you know, the state of Georgia was attempting to criminalize the activities of. Uh, a missionary uh, on the Cherokee reservation uh, in, in Georgia. And uh, the, the Supreme Court held that the, the laws of Georgia did not extend into the Cherokee territory that uh, 
Indian relations were purely the province of the of the federal government. Um, unfortunately, what followed, uh, you know, was that uh, the president at the time, Andrew Jackson, did not uh, uphold and enforce uh, that decision, and uh, that led to the the Trail of Tears and the, the forced exclusion of of the Cherokee and the other five tribes from from their homelands, as as the state essentially ignored uh, what the chief justice said. So a different time in, in our history in, in, in terms of the respect that was, or lack of respect that was accorded, you know, that set of Supreme Court decisions too. So if we follow the Trail of Tears, we get to the Oklahoma Territory, which is a, a big part of, of the McGirt um, opinion and, and Justice Gorsuch's thoughts there. But let's talk about how this case came about. Um, what, what's a good starting point for that? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a long saga and, you know, I will try not to get too deep into the procedural weeds because <laughs> that would not be interesting, but the, um, the, the case had a very interesting history, both in the Supreme Court and, and prior to it, but it's really, uh, we're talking about two cases here because last term, uh, the first time we argued this case, uh, it was a case called Murphy, Murphy v. Carpenter. And Murphy was a, a Creek citizen on death row in Oklahoma who was challenging his state conviction uh, because he said, I'm a Creek Indian and my crime took place on the Creek reservation and only the federal government or the tribe could prosecute me, not the state. Uh, but he'd been prosecuted by the state for, for murder and, and sentenced to death. Um, and so this is sort of typical of how a lot of our cases in the field of Indian law arise, that it was not the Creek Nation who brought that case. The Creek Nation had nothing to do with the genesis of the case. It was this individual tribal member asserting his rights. And he, I was all very, you know, typical of these capital cases, a long history, and he raised that claim in state courts and lost. And then he raised it in federal district court on a habeas petition and lost. By the time the case got up to the 10th circuit, um, that was the point where we became involved on behalf of the Creek Nation and recognizing that the nation's reservation status was up for grabs, you know, was, was, was really in play that Mr. Murphy was going to press it in the, in the Court of Appeals. Um, we, the nation became involved as an amicus uh, in the Tenth Circuit. Uh, we represented it. And there's a nice uh, little side story that I like to tell, especially when I'm talking to young lawyers or, or law students. But the reason the case came on our radar screen was because a young lawyer joined our firm, who was from Oklahoma, he was an Osage Indian, and he had worked on this issue in law school, worked with the public mm -hmm. defender, sort of had been the informal Indian law advisor, and was convinced that there was a very strong argument that the Creek Nation Reservation still existed, uh, which was contrary to about 100 years worth of conventional wisdom. Um, and uh, so over time, he had to convince the, the you know, supposedly, uh, older, wiser people in the firm, namely including me, that this was a, a worthwhile endeavor to take up. And it took some it took some convincing because we had a case with horrible, grisly murder facts um, and a lot of conventional wisdom running against us. And of course, you're always worried about making you know bad law, bad precedent. Uh, but over time, he sort of wore us down and convinced us. And that's when the nation became involved. And the Tenth Circuit held that the nation's reservation was still extant. And that case went up to the Supreme Court last term, and we argued it last term. And then the court, um, at the very, on the very last day of the term last year, uh, held the case over for re-argument. Uh, Justice Gorsuch was recused uh, in that case because uh, the case had come up through the Tenth Circuit. He'd sat on a habeas panel. Um, and so our, our speculation, suspicion is, you know, the court was deadlocked 4-4 and chose to then take a different case this term, the McGirt case that came out of the state court system. So Justice Gorsuch was not recused. And that's how we ended up with, with the new case with the nine justice, justices hearing it. That's great. And so you, uh, you touched on a few things there that I wanna follow up on. Um, one is certainly when, most of the time when you're looking to make law, you really try to pick the most ideal deal circumstances that you can find. Um, and certainly with um, both uh, the, um, the original case that you, you mentioned in McGirt, they're not the ideal um, <laughs> uh, 
participants in, in these um, in these cases. Um, you mentioned murder for the one, and I believe it was rape in the in the second. Um, uh, and so it's uh, it's um, that in and of itself, I imagine, would give a lot of lawyers pause as to do we really want to take this forward? Um, because sympathetic clients are always easier than than unsympathetic ones. Uh, exactly, and and that was a real part of our hesitation with the Murphy case, and and I have to say candidly, when the McGirt case came along, and that's the one that the court then took up uh, with, as you say, you know, this was sexual assault and rape of a minor. Um, I thought to myself, wow, I didn't think we could really trade down in terms of the unsavoriness of the crimes, but we we might have. Um, but that's why it, it actually became very important. Uh, I became convinced for the nation to be involved because, you know, these weren't just cases about these these horrible criminal defendants and the crimes they'd committed. But this these cases raised issues about the very existence of the Creek Nation's reservation and and really it's it's history. Um, and so I think it was critical for the nation to get in and to speak with its own voice. And one of the interesting things about Justice Gorsuch's opinion is he makes very clear early on that while this case is ostensibly about Jim C. McGirt, um, really it's about the Creek Nation and, and its history. Well, I have to imagine, uh, especially since you said, and that, that wasn't a surprise, that the law had necessarily been on the side of recognizing um, the territories and the boundaries um, for the the tribes and nations that uh, I can see one, how this case when it first started coming up might not have twigged that particular um, concern of if this gets much higher, the, I, the general concept of our boundaries and, and our existence um, as, a, as a tribe uh, might not have been sort of at the forefront of, of what was being considered. Um, but certainly then as it raises the constitutional questions you get to that point of now. Now we're now the Muskegee Creek Nation uh, is at the point where, if this goes the wrong way, then all of a sudden there are a lot of things that are more in jeopardy, or a lot of basically their entire, and not necessarily their existence, but certainly the land on which they they have established themselves, more or less, all of a sudden falls out of their control. Exactly. There's there's a there's a saying that I really like, which is, you know, tell your own story or somebody else will tell it for you. And that's what was happening in this case as it as it uh, became elevated up the, the, the food chain and, and the court hierarchy, there became just a greater and greater risk that uh, the courts were going to end up uh, telling the story of the Creek Nation without the nation having been involved. And as you say, once you start talking about the 10th Circuit or potentially the Supreme Court, you know, what we see in, in tribal cases often is these recorded court decisions become a significant part of a tribe's history. And, and often they're what people look to in, in citing to and, and making claims about a, a tribe's history. And so it essentially at some point became just imperative for the nation to, to, to speak up and try to frame that history itself. Well, and some of the headlines coming out after the decision itself were a little, what's the right word here? Um, inflammatory is sort of the word that comes to mind. I, one I'm thinking, and I, I'm sorry to say, I can't remember which newspaper this was in, but basically it said the court essentially gives half of Oklahoma um, to the Indian nations. Um, and so I, I also think it's important for our audience, we talk a little bit about what did the decision actually do um, <laughs> as opposed to to what some of the headlines have said that it's doing? Right. Great, great question. Uh, and I'm, I'm really glad you asked because this is something that um, that often, as you say, does get confused or conflated in the in the popular media. But this was a case about reservation boundaries. The question was uh, the treaty, the Creek treaties in 1832, 1833 and 1866 established a homeland for the Creeks. Uh, in, the, in the Indian Territory, you know, where they'd been marched westward. And uh, over time, those boundaries were defined and in the 1866 treaty were reduced, but still encompassed about um, 3 million acres. And the question was, did those boundaries, have they survived to this day? So it's really a jurisdictional question, not a question about title to the land within those boundaries. So, you know, just as in my home state of Michigan or in New York, uh, within the boundaries of the state, uh, obviously there's a tremendous amount of private 
land ownership. And nothing about the boundaries affects that land ownership. And that's very much the case with, with Indian reservations. You can have, and you do have, you know, large quantities of private land holdings within an Indian reservation. And over time, given how history unfolded, much of that land is owned by non-Indians. And the court, Supreme Court has said for a very long time, there's nothing inconsistent between private land, non-Indian land holdings and, and the existence of an Indian reservation. So the, the implications of the case have more to do with governmental authority, who has the ability to regulate and to tax within uh, the reservation boundaries. And even there, uh, some of the consequences have been pretty significantly overstated because the another, another thing the Supreme Court has held and made clear over time is that with respect to non-Indians on fee land within reservation boundaries, tribes, powers, uh, you know, have been pretty significantly curtailed. So it's not like everybody woke up in eastern Oklahoma the day after the, the decision and A, either you know, lost their land or B, was subject to the full powers of the Creek Nation as opposed to the state of Oklahoma. Well, and one other thing that uh, an argument the state of Oklahoma made too was that it throws some of the um, the enforcement of law question into, or some of the enforcement of laws into question. And so, you know, in terms of, they made it sound like there would be criminals running free in the streets now because because of this decision. Um, and so also want to touch a little bit on that, that that's decidedly not what where this where this opinion is going. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of alarmist rhetoric in what the state said, and it's it's the way that people litigate cases. But yes, no, absolutely not. And you know, as we told the court, nobody has a greater stake in um, enforcement of the criminal laws and, and the public safety on the Creek Reservation than the Creek Nation itself. It's simply a really a question of who is exercising that authority, and you know, the the implication of the decision is that uh, criminal law enforcement shifts from with respect, and again, this is limited with respect to. Um, Indians on the reservation shifts from the state to the federal government and, and the nation, um, where crimes are committed solely involving non-Indians uh, under the well-established law that remains within the purview of, of the state. And what, you know, Oklahoma is a very interesting place because there are substantial populations of Indians and the tribes have a substantial presence. And despite the state's litigation rhetoric, there's actually a pretty good history of the sovereigns all working together. And you know that's what will unfold here will be cooperative agreements to ensure that you know nobody falls between the cracks and that criminal jurisdiction is uh, allocated across the, the spectrum. In fact, Justice Gorsuch even specifically says that in his opinion that there's, there is that long tradition in history and he has no expectation that that would change going forward. One of the, uh, um, I'm sorry. No, no go ahead. I was going to say just one of the really, and, and maybe we'll get to this again a little later, but one of the really refreshing things about Justice Gorsuch's decision is in a lot of our cases, we hear these claims about consequences and, you know, the dire straits that will follow if, if the court is to rule in favor of the tribes. And Justice Gorsuch, as he has in other areas of law, uh, just shows a much greater skepticism towards those claims um, than the court sometimes has. And it's basically taken the view that, look, we're going to our job is to interpret and enforce the law and uh, other people can worry about uh, the consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, and you had mentioned something as well with regard to the Creek Nation uh, and their, their um, uh, what they have established on, on their lands already. And, and so they have their own police force. Um, sorry, and some of this is some of my own research too. So they have their own police force, they have their own elected government. Um, they have basically everything that the non-Native uh, American population would consider as the structures of government um, within their within their sovereign nations. Yes, and that was a and very... So that, I'm ahead. sorry, go ahead. No, no, there's a little bit of a time lag, I think. So I, I, um, I sometimes talk over you, so please continue. That was a very important piece of the story, you know, for the nation to tell um, just the extent to which it has a, a really robust government and has been exercising robust governmental authority, you know, throughout the reservation for a very long time. And, and it's something that people outside of the 
the, the tribal world don't always fully appreciate. Um, and even within the tribal world, the extent to which uh, the Creeks and, and some of the other tribes in Oklahoma exercise governmental authority is, is, is very striking because they are you know, amongst the most uh, sophisticated and well-resourced uh, tribal governments in the country. So as you mentioned, you know, uh, a, a robust police force, healthcare, uh, education, family violence protection, infrastructure. You know, a lot of what the state tried to do in this case was to make it about Tulsa, because one of the, you know, one of the reasons why this court is, uh, the case has received so much attention is not simply that it involves a large land area, you know, 3 million acres, but the, the northeast corner of the, the reservation that, that lies the city of Tulsa, most of Tulsa falls within the reservation boundaries. Um, but uh, the bulk of the reservation is rural Oklahoma and Oklahoma is not a wealthy state. Uh, and so in much of the reservation, it's actually the Creek Nation that's providing you know, the, the funding and the inf for infrastructure, you know, uh, roads, bridges, um, water, utilities uh, for the benefit of both Creek citizens and non-Indians, uh, the Creeks are providing, you know, much of that. So that was something we really uh, wanted to tell the court and, and emphasized. And the nice thing was, it wasn't only us telling the court, but we also had an amicus brief from state, former state officials. Uh, and actually the lead signatory in that brief was Tom Cole, you know, one of the highest ranking Republicans in the, in the House of Representatives, uh, basically extolling the virtues of what the Creeks and the other governments are doing in, in Eastern Oklahoma. Okay. Well, and there's one particular part of the uh, nation's uh, infrastructure or uh, government entities that I want to touch on as well, because um, this was something new for me when I was was doing my research and that was the idea of the peacemaker or peacemaking courts that several nations have it's not just the creek the seneca nation um near jamestown has has such a, has a similar structure and there are other other nations as well um so this might be a this might be a little bit too general of a question to ask but i'll start here um how has the i'll call it the traditional or the non-native american judicial system um, viewed the tribal justice system? Has there been a challenge with recognition of that as a valid justice system? Um, so let's, let's start there. So it's, it's a great question. And, you know, it ties in a lot of history and sort of ties into a, a lot of the historical treatment of tribal institutions more generally. But the sort of the nutshell answer is that for a long period of time, uh, there was a great deal of skepticism about uh, tribal courts and tribal institutions more generally, and federal policy, you know, dating, this is dating back to the 19th century, uh, was to try and snuff out uh, tribal institutions that did not look like our Anglo-American institutions, and that very much included the courts, and it actually was a big piece of the, the story in, in this case, because in the late latter part of the 19th century and early 20th century, Congress passed a series of statutes which essentially eliminated the Creek courts, uh, forbade uh, the courts from existing, forbade federal courts from according any recognition to, uh, to the tribal courts. And that is in part because that system of justice looked strange and foreign to, um, to Congress and, and American decision makers. And without overgeneralizing, um, you know, they're uh, between tribes. Um, there is a sort of strong set of restorative justice principles that have often informed, you know, tribal courts and tribal justice uh, around the around the country. And uh, but for many decades um, after that, there the the tribal courts were not allowed to function. And then federal policy shifted, as as it has with respect to tribes generally. Starting in 1970, it was, it was Richard Nixon's um, self determination proclamation that sort of set federal policy on a new course of recognizing and encouraging tribal self-determination and tribal governmental institutions. And so slowly over time after that proclamation, the federal government's position has changed and tribes have reinvigorated many of their institutions, traditional institutions, and that includes uh, the courts. So at the Creek Nation, at the Seneca Nation, as you mentioned, tribes around the country uh, you now see really vibrant 
functioning court systems, which tend to both incorporate, you know, um, elements of the Anglo-American court system as we know it. And, and, and so you have many court proceedings, which would look very familiar to uh, the lawyers on, 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 on this call. Um, and, uh, you know, trial judges, appellate judges, uh, jury trials, the whole, the whole gamut, uh, but also often include a restorative justice track. Uh, or and or, and or incorporate those principles into uh, into decision making. And one of the really interesting things to have seen over the last ten or fifteen years is how now some state court systems are starting to incorporate those principles into their own decision making. And how there's a lot of cross pollination between uh, the state courts and the tribal courts. And here in my home state of Michigan, there's actually a very close relationship between the tribal and state courts and a a forum and you see more and more state courts incorporating these peacemaking notions into their into their jurisprudence. Would you be able to drill down for us a little bit on what are some of those restorative principles or some of, of what makes the peacemaker courts different than really the Anglo-American? This, this sense that it's not just a purely adversarial system or adversarial approach where uh, you have a wrongdoer and that wrongdoer is going to be punished. So here you've got the, the state or the government on one side with the victim and you've got the wrongdoer on the other side and the, the heavy hand of the state is gonna be brought down on, on the wrongdoer and essentially we're looking at punishment and, and deterrence, but a, a sense that sometimes by bringing the parties together um, and figuring out uh, remedies or, or uh, that may actually help to repair the relations that may restore the victim, you know, make the victim feel whole, but in a way that just doesn't involve punishing the, the defendant that actually societal peace and the, the interests of the individuals involved can be more uh, ably advanced. This ties into, we had a conversation with David Crane last week uh, about his experience Experiences as the um, chief prosecutor in Sierra Leone um, for the for the war crimes tribunal there, and he mentioned part of his uh, establishing work was really doing a lot of listening tours, and so he traveled all around Sierra Leone to talk to the victims, or more accurately, to listen to the victims. Um, and he told a couple of stories regarding their concept of justice, looking nothing like the Anglo-American concept of justice. And, and while certainly there was a desire to punish some of the, the, you know, the most extreme perpetrators of these, for a lot of them, what they really just wanted was to be able to tell their stories and feel that someone had heard that story. Um, and next week, we're actually talking with uh, Professor John Hansen um, from the Systemic Justice Project at Harvard Law School about the concept of justice and sort of all of the lenses through which you can view justice. And this, this, these peacemaker courts sort of also fit very nicely in that, in that discussion. I think that's exactly right. And that, that sort of emphasis is you just put it on being able to tell stories and the victim being able to tell stories and the perpetrator. And, you know, the Native American tradition, of course, was an oral tradition. Uh, for for many many tribes, and so that uh, ability to to tell stories and, and sort of the process of healing that can sometimes come out through storytelling is very central to uh, to many tribal justice systems. Well, and you and I had talked a little bit too, and you alluded to this earlier about some of the um, what might come next out of out of this opinion. You talked about um, Justice Gorsuch's lack of emphasis on, on what the consequences of this might be, um, because he, his, his general judicial bent is to pay attention to the words and the text, and, and the words and the text in this case were very clear. Um, so so what, what are some of the, 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 um, the implications of, his, of, of this opinion? So it's, it's really interesting to see just how strongly this opinion has resonated with people and the, the, the sort of the reaction to it has been incredibly powerful. Um, and I think there are, you know, a few reasons for that. One is just that it does tie uh, 
the issue here about the Creek Nation and the Trail of Tears and the way he started his opinion with, you know, at the end of the Trail of Tears stood a promise. It does tie into a, a piece of American history that people know about and and and, and understand. Uh, so it's probably just the, the, the setting. But a, a, a lot of it has to do with what he said and how he said it, which takes us back to Justice Jackson. And it, it, he wrote this opinion in a way that, you know, these words really resonate. And there were two aspects, I, I think, of what he said that were especially powerful. One is the, the point that we've touched on that, that you um, just referred to, which is this view that we are not, you know, it's not our business as the court to be concerned about these claims of consequences. That's for the political branches. And especially in our field of Indian law, really for the last three or four decades, the court has very much been in the business of caring about consequences. And, you know, in our view, doing what should be Congress's job of trying to allocate power in a way that, you know, makes sense from a policy point of view, the court has really imposed its own uh, policy views. And he said very forcefully, we should not be in that business, you know, and he's a huge believer in the separation of powers, which of course, again, ties back to, to Justice Jackson in some ways. Um, and, and that came through very clearly in this opinion, as you said, you know, he's a, Congress has primacy in the area of Indian affairs, and hence, we are going to look first and foremost to Congress's words, the text of what Congress said, and we are not going to impute or infer meaning based on our sense of consequences. And the, the second, and equally, if perhaps even more important, is his very strong statements that just because over a long period of time, tribes were not ex able to exercise certain powers because essentially the federal government and or the states prevented them from doing so in violation of the law, we're not gonna extrapolate from that long absence of tribal authority a conclusion that the, that authority no longer exists. And that's where some of his most powerful language comes out, including uh, you know the phrase that, that I love from the opinion about, you know, we're not governed by the rule of the strong, but the rule of law. And that again is, you know, has not, uh, and, and this may be surprising to some, but that is not a principle that the court has enunciated in Indian law cases that faithfully uh, in the last several decades. And we definitely have cases on the books where the court has essentially taken a course of illegal encroachment of, of tribal rights over the course of time and ossify that into a holding that uh, therefore the, the tribal powers in, in question no longer, no longer exist. And this opinion very forcefully rejects that. So I think it will have, for both those reasons, have a lot of application, you know, beyond the specific context of reservation boundaries. I did, I did find his language interesting there because it's a, it's a fairly well-established legal concept in a, a wide variety of law that once you stop doing something, you may very well lose the right to pick that up again, you know, whether that's trademark or as, as you were just talking here. And I thought it particularly interesting that he made that determination because it wasn't it wasn't something necessarily the tribes themselves had decided to stop doing. And that was important in this determining in, in his determination of this. It was something that outside forces more or less posed upon them. And, and so it wasn't, I, I just really took to heart. I think that lack of voluntariness um, was important to him in, in his thought process. I think that's exactly right. You know, and he's a very good and careful student of, history and understanding, you know, how things uh, came to be is, is, is so important. But, you know, here, for example, in this case, and this was pretty typical across the country at the turn of the 20th century, you had the federal government, federal agents in the field, Bureau of Indian Affairs agents, um, saying without any authority, this was not congressionally blessed, telling the Creek Nation that, you know, its legislature could not meet, uh, it could not elect its own chiefs, the BIA was going to handpick uh, uh, puppets, um, to, to deal with, that the Creeks could not um, exercise all manner of governmental authority. This was really uh, what later were called, you know, these imperial czars uh, controlling these res reservations and snuffing out tribal power for the matter of decades. And so you really had in the historical record, you know, the absence of 
uh, of a tremendous amount of the exercise of robust authority just wasn't on the books. But the reason it wasn't on the books was, as you say, it wasn't voluntary. It was because the the overriding domination of the federal government preventing uh, the Creeks from doing that. And so that's why he looked at this through that lens and said, well, we're certainly not going to take that illegal usurpation of Creek authority and then hold that uh, the Creek authority uh, no longer, you know, no longer exists. And one thing we've also been grappling with in these teas and um, Ruth Marcus was, was the Robert H. Jackson lecturer at the Chautauqua Institution a couple of weeks ago and she touched on this as well um, as to how um, some of the conservative justices um, through their through their lens end up um, uh, with seemingly liberal results um, in their opinions. And this is, I think, another one of the Gorsuch cases this term um, that seem to many to to have surprised them if what they're focused on is his, the fact that he was appointed uh, by a conservative um, president and espouses a conservative um, ideology and judicial outlook. Well, you know, I think very firmly that Justice Gorsuch is a, he's not just a textualist, but he's a, he's a principled textualist and principled textualism can often lead to results that, you know, might be viewed as politically liberal and, you know, and I really, I don't love the labels liberal and conservative as they get applied to judges because I think that can get very contorted very quickly. But honestly, in, in our field of the, of the law or as, as a litigator, I strong, I generally have a strong preference for judges who are principal textualists because then you truly don't have sort of personal predilections coming into the, the, the decision making and it's a lot easier to know what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the language and the words, and then you can center your arguments uh, around that. And certainly in our field of law, if there is sort of a faithful commitment to the language of the, the relevant treaties and statutes that often uh, dictates results that are in favor of the tribes. And where we've had the real issues is with courts departing from those words, again, because of their concerns about policy or, or, or consequences. Well, and you just raised an interesting point. I, I believe you are our first tea guest so far who has argued um, before the Supreme Court. And so um, were you, and I, I, I know you are, or, or argued the, the first uh, case that we talked about to the Murphy one. Um, how do you structure your argument then in terms of what you think is going to appeal to the various justices or you know, try to anticipate the questions that they might have for you? Um, in, sir, in, you know, in this instance, I probably have observed the court for many years and sort of have a sense of where each buddy, each person lays um, in their judicial preferences um, and how to speak to them. But could you give our audience a little bit of a flavor of how you, how you craft an argument for the court? Sure. And it, you know, it, between those two arguments, it, there was actually pretty significant variation in the in the approach, just given the, the, the posture of the case. So it, it is partly a case by case, argument by argument issue. But in the first case, in, in the Murphy argument, which I did you know, live, I was the, I knew I was gonna be the fourth person to argue. Um, the state uh, argued and then uh, the United States argued in support of the state. So uh, Ed Needler from the Solicitor General's office, then Mr. Murphy's lawyer argued and then me. Um, so what that meant is I knew that by the time I got up, I would have heard a lot of questions from the court and would have a sense as to what was really on the court's mind. So what I had in front of me at a council table was a list of sort of the eight or nine major issues in the case. And as we went through, and I knew I was going to have time to maybe hit three. Um, and so as we went through the argument, I was sitting there checking the ones that I thought, okay, here's where I really need to make sure I, I, I get in some, some points. And what became clear in that first argument, the Murphy argument, was that the court, a lot of the questions, and, and, and again, remember Justice Gorsuch was not sitting in that case, a lot of the questions were about consequences, about practicalities, and about understanding you know, the, the Creek Nation and, and to the, what extent it actually had a robust government. So much of my argument in that case was not about the law and the text and you know, where we really wanted to win the case. 
but having this feeling that I needed to reinforce for the court, uh, that court that, you know, the world was not going to blow up if they ruled in, in, in the Creek's favor, because there seemed to be an understanding on, on a, the part of at least some of the justices, maybe enough of the justices that the law favored us, but I had to lay those, those concerns. The second time around, um, which was this, I argue that the case remotely uh, from my family room with the court doing this, you know, structured sequential questioning. So each justice was going to have this sort of two and a half minute time block, um, that was a very different uh, preparation because I knew that each justice would have a chance to answer questions that I wouldn't get interrupted in answering them. So there you're thinking more about each particular justice and where they might be coming from. I obviously had the advantage that we'd gone through it once before, so I had a pretty decent sense. Um, but there also the strong sense that, look, you know, they likely deadlocked the last time. What's new in this case, Justice Gorsuch, and so for both the briefing and the argument, and it was easy for us because it really fit well with our arguments, um, there was a focus on him. And uh, for us, that meant an emphasis on the text and the separation of powers and all the issues which we would have emphasized anyway, but were put an even sort of sharper point on them. That makes sense. Yes, I had forgotten um, that during all of this time that they had, the court had also moved to uh, remote arguments um, and uh, should have been top of mind since we're doing this remotely as well. But uh, <laughs> yes, I have to imagine that that's a very different experience. Um, I'm going to ask you a question on that, but I'm going to prep our audience first um, to start thinking about their questions and start asking them uh, in the chat on Facebook. Um, but also, sort of, how do you? How was the virtual argument system? Did it did it work? Was it just strange. I mean, you're so used to arguing before the court and having the justices interrupt you as they think of things and want to want to poke at, at various things that you said. Yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't mind it. I, I think I liked it more than 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 some people have commented. There was some obvious disadvantages. You know, one, it was by phone, so you couldn't see the the visual cues. Uh, I think that was a little bit less of a concern in in our case because, as I say, I had argued it once and in person had a sense of where, you know, most of the justices were coming from and certainly, you know, didn't mind not seeing Justice Alito scowl at me. Like that wasn't really a loss from my point of view. Um, but you, you, you do lose a little bit not seeing the visual cues. And then because of this sort of sequential questioning, it was a little bit less free flowing and there was a little bit less of an ability to go back to a point that had been made and try to tie things together. I and mean, we still all tried to do that, but it was just harder in that, in that way. But there were also some, you know, uh, some advantages, uh, just some purely logistical ones, including, you know, being able to sleep in my own bed the night before argument. And I'm an old curmudgeonly guy now. And, you know, that was nice not having to slap everything on the plane. And, um, and I did the argument and from my family room with, you know, my wife and my, my kids right there. And that was kind of nice. And my son, who's a, He's a bit of a joker after I was done with my portion of the argument, he ran into the kitchen and grabbed me a beer and which I hasten to add, <laughs> I did not drink, but it was a nice sort of comical moment. Um, and being on the phone, it just really did force you to, you know, really actively engage with the, the question and the questioner. And you did have the advantage of not being interrupted, you know, because the court, the way arguments happen these days, uh, it's such an active bench that sometimes you don't get to fully answer a question before the next one comes. And that was less of an issue in, in this format. Makes sense. All right, so one of the first questions we have um, is, uh, I guess, I think sort of a, a global question. It's, were you surprised by the result of this case? Were you surprised that the opinion came down in favor um, of the Greek nation? So I am, you know, I am a natural born optimist. So I, I was sort of uh, had faith throughout the, throughout the process. Um, but, you know, it would be foolhardy to say that, you know, we thought that that the win was guaranteed or anything of the sort. And generally, as I, I've been polling people, both people very involved in the case and, and then just people in our field of law generally, and it sort of has come down sort of 60, 40, like 60% of the people say they thought we were going to win and 40% and say they were very concerned. Uh, so, you know, it was clearly a, uh, it was a very close case. The issues were very important. The fact that we had to re-argue it. And even before we re-argued it last term, the court asked for supplemental briefing. So we, 
you know, we had argument and there was supplemental briefing that they re-argued it. So clearly there were a lot of cross currents. Um, so one could not be sanguine about the, what was going to happen, but we did feel pretty good coming out of the second argument. We certainly felt very good about Justice Gorsuch. He was not really the, the justice we were concerned about. Um, and uh, so the outcome was a, it was a huge relief, um, but it, uh, it felt very firming. The biggest, I think, surprise for me was, uh, and I know that Justice Gorsuch can write a really good opinion, and we've seen other examples of that, but just just the sheer power of this decision has been you know, really, really nice to see. Well, you and I had talked a little bit too about how for certainly much of your practice, um, but most of uh, the, the Supreme Court decisions or court decisions in general that impact uh, uh, the tribes and the nations um, have the, they have been in a defensive posture. And so it's really trying to prevent additional chipping away at their territories or their rights or their sovereignty, um, or what have you. And this is possibly the first decision, I'm not sure if I'd go all the way back to Marshall's trilogy, but um, possibly the first decision that really has, um, it is, is broader than, than that defensive position and might actually enable you to move forward um, in a strategic manner as well. No, that's absolutely right. So when I situate the decision sort of in the course of my career, you know, I've represented tribes for about a quarter century now. Uh, there has this, this feels like a little bit of a, a, a watershed. And uh, as you say, um, for almost my entire career, uh, the court has not generally been thought of as sympathetic to tribal issues and tribal rights. And we have had to be uh, very careful and sort of to really preach caution and care to the tribes about the court. Um, and the playbook has generally been try to win cases in the lower courts, the courts of appeal, and then try to keep them out of the court. Because once you get to the Supreme Court, you don't know what's going to happen. And what had happened when in the 70s and early 80s, the court had actually been reasonably favorable to tribes. And there were a series of pretty nice decisions that were sort of consistent with you know what I described as the the Nixon policy, the new policy, the federal government. It seemed like the political branches in the court were in pretty good uh, lockstep. And then with the Rehnquist court, things started to go bad. And by the late 90s, um, the decisions were getting really hostile. Uh, and that's, you know, it was my misfortune. That's that's when I started practicing. But I clerked at the court and I, um, I started really preaching to tribes, you know, we need to coordinate advocacy and do all these various things that the states were doing with respect to the Supreme Court. And we got to be really careful. And for, for many, many years, that's been the approach. But really, it's been three justices, the addition of whom have made a difference. It started with Justice Sotomayor, who's shown a really deep-seated interest in tribal issues, and then Justice Kagan, the same. Um, and then now Justice Gorsuch. With those three, we have a really nice core of justices who uh, really care about the issues and view them you know, sort of with fidelity to first principles. So. We're not sort of abandoning the caution anytime soon, but it does feel like we might be in a, in a somewhat different place now. Okay. We have a question from Helena and it is, what unforeseen consequences do you predict um, as a result of this decision? And it seems as if her, her thinking is focused more on the relationship between the non-native communities and the native communities. So my, my hope is that uh, the sort of the unforeseen consequence will be um, you know, an even greater degree of cooperation that people will find because there will be the need to negotiate and work together on all manner of issues that that will lead to an even deeper, uh, stronger set of, of, of relationships. And that, that's, that's the hope. And that's not to minimize the amount of work that needs to be done. There will be a lot of work involved in addressing all these various issues. And I'm sure there are issues that, you know, we haven't fully thought of or, or contemplated. Um, but I think there's a pretty good baseline there for, for that work going productively. Well, and that was, you know, going back to our conversation about the consequences focus of the court, that was certainly one of the folk guy of the dissent um, was that not enough attention was being given to what the 
consequences of this decision might be. Yeah, this whole you know parade of horribles, and we see that a lot. We see that in a lot of cases, but in almost all circumstances, you know, they don't pan out that way. Um, and I'm certainly hopeful that's the case here. And I know there's already a lot of hard work being done on um, on, on various various issues. Um, would you like to give us any insight into some of the other matters on which you are working in this realm? That what what else might we be seeing that might be coming up? Well, one of the uh, besides, you know, we have a lot of cases that involve these jurisdictional issues and reservation issues, and I think we will see more of that, especially in the wake of the, the decision. One of the other areas that I'm especially interested in is the intersection between tribal rights and environmental issues. Uh, and we're seeing more more of a focus there where the tribe's treaty rights are, um, the tribes are asserting those in the, to, to facilitate or foster greater environmental and habitat protection because, you know, many of the tribes treaty rights, like rights to fish and hunt, they're worthless if there's nothing to hunt and fish for. And, and that's what we're seeing in a lot of parts of the country. So we've had uh, a number of cases, including the last case we had in the court before this one, involving the extent to which the tribe's treaty rights can be used as a sword in some ways to secure a me uh, some measure of, of habitat and environmental protection. Also, uh, you know, greater assertion of tribal uh, land rights with respect to these issues, you know, to fight off uh, mining or pipelines. We have a really big pipeline case right now where, you know, tribes had all these things hoisted on them at a time when they really lacked power. It was, it was the rule of the strong. And now we're trying to reassert the, the rule of law. How might this decision help with those, with those arguments? I think uh, in, a, in a few ways, one is, you know, at, at sort of the, the narrower level, the, the this emphasis on looking at the text of agreements and uh, both statutes and, and, and treaties, you know, again, the, those generally can favor our positions. And then more strongly, this notion that when promises were made, it's for the courts to enforce them. And, uh, and just that sort of full-throated endorsement of that principle, because in a lot of our cases, that's exactly what we're talking about. You know, the tribes were promised a measure of control and sovereignty over their lands and the ability to govern themselves. And it's been honored so much in the breach. Uh, and, and, and a lot of the, what are the tribes asserting now is no, we really do have this authority. It was never taken away by Congress and you, the courts should be in the business of, of enforcing our rights, not, not defeasing them. Well, in terms of talking and thinking about consequences as well, since there have been a number of rollbacks of environmental protections um, over the last few years. Um, this is certainly, uh, it seems a, another area really primed for a showdown of, of, of sovereignty discussions and, 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 and primacy of those. Um, and, uh, and how, you know, I think of perhaps some irony in that the, um, the, the nations may be, may be able to um, sort of hold back the the change in in some of these because because of their their role in our society which most people don't think about no i think that's exactly right you know and we're in such a battle now and you know now it's really the executive branch that's at a lockstep and in, in terms of recognizing and honoring tribal rights and you know especially where those rights are getting in the way of development, energy development, and, and otherwise, uh, you know, a sort of real desire to, to crush uh, the tribes and, and the assertion of those rights. And so that's where, you know, the tribes have a really important role to play in, in trying to assert and preserve, you know, the, the, the rule of law and, and, and their prerogatives. And, and we're just really hopeful that the, the courts will understand and, and see it that way. We have a question from Shannon, and she wonders if you could talk a little bit about the leg, the legal aspect of the treaties. Um, and when these treaties are broken, uh, is it usually on eminent domain grounds or there or some other legal grounds? So, you know, the treaties are, it's a, it's a really interesting question and, and there's, there's a long history, but the treaties are meant to be the supreme, supreme law of the land. They're recognized in the constitution as supreme law of the land what uh, you know became the law, and this is the latter part of the 19th century, and this is not necessarily intuitive, and I'm not 
I don't think Justice Jackson would have subscribed to this principle. The court ended up holding that even though the United States had entered into treaty promises, that Congress had the plenary power to abrogate uh, those treaties. So uh, what became the law was that this history we've seen in this country of the breaking of treaty promises was actually legally sanctioned, that Congress just had the unilateral authority to do that, which of course put the tribes in a horrible position, including a horrible bargaining position. And you had a lot of treaties renegotiated where the tribes, again, it wasn't voluntary, had had no choice but to acquiesce in you know, the reduction in their lands and the reduction in their powers because Congress could do it anyway. Um, and uh, so then what we're left with is where we are now, which is politically that doesn't happen anymore, right? There's no political will to just abrogate unilaterally treaties. And so that's why we are now in the in the realm of the courts where with the promises that are remaining, the question is whether those get vindicated or, or not. All right, well, Riaz, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, as a reminder, next week, we will be speaking with Professor John Hansen. And as I mentioned, John is the coder Director of the Systemic Justice Project at Harvard Law School. And we'll be talking about justice and the many lenses through which you can view that um, and the impacts that those views have in our systems and our, and our equity. Um, thank you again to the Jamestown Bar Association for sp sponsoring today's tea. And Riaz, thank you so much for having tea with me today. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.